So uh, where is everybody from? Oh, we're in Canada. Um, St. Catharines, Ontario. From uh, Ottawa originally, but grew up in the Niagara. Cool, cool. Let's see. And you're from Notre Dame? No, from Notre Dame. Yeah, Robertson. Robertson? How did you? Where are you from? I'm from Vienna. Oh, well, welcome. I know you. How about where, where are you from? Central Michigan. Central. The Chip Chip West now, right? Ah. How about you? You're from. That, that, that's right, from Drew, right? That's right. And then you're from here, okay? Well, uh, in my efforts to stall time, uh, my name is Josh Blackman. I'm a law professor at South Texas Law School. Hello. And uh, I guess we'll get started in a minute. Do you specialize in health law? Uh, Josh, uh, no, I don't. And um, it's only by, by, by fluke coincidence that health law intersects with constitutional law this year. Might never happen again. <laughs> so this is probably my one time my one time invitation to this conference. There's still a session down there, so we have one more. All right, I, I can stall. I can I can kill time. It does. I I was, I was yeah. being somewhat facetious, but, um, <laughs> but not this clearly. Uh, but no, I don't really have any strong background in health law. Um, and I think actually one interesting element to this is a lot of professors of health law who really did nothing in constitutional law for us forced to come to speed very quickly on this. Um, there was one guy who's at Wake Forest, says health law, what's his name? Um, oh God. It'll kill me because he's a good friend. Uh, he was actually one of the, the preeminent health law experts and he was involved in the drafting of this law from the beginning. And a lot of people were actually uh, asking him, oh, so is this constitutional? And he's like, I haven't taken common law since law school. I don't know anything about this. And then, and then I, you know, I was doing an interview with him. I was like, yeah, I have to re go back and reread all this con law stuff, which I, none of it I'd remember. So you had this interesting um, uh, dichotomy with this case where con law guys had to become experts in health law really quick. <laughs> and health law experts had to become experts on con law really quick. Neither of them probably knew what they were talking about in the other field subject. So I'm going to stick to the con law stuff. I'll... No, oh, no, I'm just, I'm just doing stand-up. <laughs> And I think one of the failings of um, healthcare challenge was that um, con law people weren't quite attuned to a lot of the policy implications of the Affordable Care Act. And I think that's one of the largest failings of this challenge that the challenge was so far divorced from uh, reality in some respects. And I think. Well, that, I mean, Randy Barnett was so Well, Ra Randy's actually writing the forward to my book, but uh, and Randy's a good friend. But but I, I'm actually writing a chapter in the book about how. Well, it almost worked, and it actually kind of did work. Yeah, and the government never really had a good answer to it either, so it wasn't that bad of an argument. Talk about that. Yeah. Yep. Uh, go, please, go get coffee. We're, they're running late downstairs, so I think I'm just up here doing stand up and killing time. All right. So, uh, let's see. And are you, you're at the law school? Yeah. And do you specialize in health law or constitutional law? Or? I specialize in student law. <laughs> I do a whole bunch of things. And uh, one of the years we integrate between common law and health law. So, uh, but still, I was taken by surprise, uh, as everybody else was by, by this decision. What was your, um, if I can ask, not to turn the spot, but what was your initial reaction to this case when uh, the law was first enacted? What did you think of the challenge when you know, this, this, oh, this challenge first came down the pipe? So I, um, I thought that on the basis of Philbin uh, and, and the great, uh, that uh, this would succeed in the face of a Commerce Clause challenge. Um, I thought that that uh, Wilker in Massachusetts was actually a brilliant guy, said that Congress can be fired by Rodney, but not me. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, that sort of caught it right. As you know, it's the only oral argument in history that Rodney came up. Um, and seemed to be a metaphor for uh, how far can Congress go. So I didn't see the Congress clause challenge.
down the list, um, as, as should have succeeded. You ask the other question, were there votes on the court for the Commerce Clause challenge? It's funny, actually, the cover of my book is actually, I'm, I'm thinking of just having a piece of broccoli, and that's it. Uh, I'm debating, I'm deba it's just be a white background with broccoli. Oh, there'll be a picture of, there'll be a picture of the Supreme Court, but I think I, I, I made a mock-up of cover of just, just like broccoli and the Supreme Court. But I canceled potato, right? <laughs> oh, ooh. Oh, really? That's right, Derek Jeter's from Kalamazoo. I forgot that. I'm a Yankees fan. So that, I was wondering why I saw a picture of Derek Jeter in the hotel. I was trying to figure that out. I went to George Mason Law School in Arlington, Virginia. Houston. Not really. It's kind of central. I mean, it's yeah. not, not like South Central. That's a totally different deal. Yeah. I love it. I like it. I've been there now two months. It's a lot of fun. It's a cool city. They gave me a job, so I have nothing. Yeah. I have absolutely nothing to complain about. It's close to New Orleans, too. Maybe four hours from New Orleans, I think. And I've never made the drive to New Orleans. <laughs> I will eventually, though. Oh, thank you. Appreciate you that. Uh, really? Yes, really. Oh, check it out. Oh, yeah. Hey, come on, we didn't start yet. Just killing. I I will check out Galveston sometime soon. <laughs> Okay. Hey, right. how are you doing? Well, welcome, everybody. Oh, you're Brian. Hey. Uh, hey. I'm Josh Blackman. Good to meet you. My name is Val. I'm a PhD student in the philosophy department at Tulane University. Um, so, those of you who don't know, I think uh, I'm missing a few of our panel members. This panel actually started because Fritz and I are, are editors, he's the editor in chief, I'm the managing editor at Public Affairs Quarter View. And we recently um, accepted papers for a special issue to be published on the decision. And we got such a strong response for it that we were, well, Fritz and I in the middle of a book proposal to, to sort of bring all of these papers into an editor's wall. Um, so this panel sort of arose out of the out of the really strong response that we had for that. So we we're excited to, to have some of the papers presented here. Get some feedback on them before we before we publish it. So, with that, uh, introduce y'all to Josh Black. Hi, hi everybody. Oh yeah, we did have a little bit of a schedule change. One of our presenters um, in the twelve forty five session was unable to make it. So we're going to bump everything up a half an hour, and at the end of the, the mini symposium, we're going to have a half hour open discussion. Down the table. So um, we can talk about all the papers. Then, um, or we can talk about other issues we might be doing. Okay. Right. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Josh Blackman. I'm a law professor at the South Texas College of Law. Thank you very much to uh, Drew, uh, uh, Nate, and Fitz, Fritz, and everybody else for bringing me out here. Uh, this has been a very interesting conference because it brings together people of very diverse interests people with medical backgrounds, people with humanities backgrounds, and for some reason, a lawyer. Now, why is a lawyer? Oh, we have another lawyer in the house. Why would you invite a lawyer to a conference on medical humanities? Um, one very important reason, the Supreme Court very recently had a case involving things that are very near and dear to your heart, health care. Uh, just this past June, the Supreme Court decided NFIB v. Sebelius. This was the health care case, or as you might know it, Obamacare. This case considered whether Congress, in its efforts to pass comprehensive health care reform, could mandate that individuals purchase health insurance. If individuals fail to buy this health insurance, uh, ignore, just ignore that. So in their efforts to, uh, to make sure that everyone would have health care, they mandated that people would have to buy it with certain exceptions. Now this was a law that affected a vast section of the economy. And when it was originally enacted, there was very 
very few doubts at whether this law was constitutional. If I were to go back to a constitutional law class in law school at some point in, say, 2009, and for my final exam question, I said, could Congress pass a law imposing a tax on people who choose not to purchase health care? The answer would have been yes. If a student would have said no, he probably would have failed the exam. Fast forward to the year 2012, where the Supreme Court, on a very narrow basis, almost struck down this law as violating the Constitution. In fact, five justices said that Congress did not have the power to enact this law, but only by a very curious and saving construction by the Chief Justice with their five votes to save the law. So what happened between 2009 and 2012? The Constitution certainly didn't change. There's been no amendments. There's been no changes to our fundamental laws. This wasn't a challenge based on, for example, originalism, or what did the founders think about commerce, and what did the founders of the Constitution think about our nation, but rather what changed how people view the Constitution, how the people were able to affect how courts understand constitutional law. This is something we call popular constitutionalism, the notion that the people can actually impact and affect the way courts construe the law. There's this notion that when you make an argument about the law, it might be kind of crazy, uh, to quote Jack Balkin, it's kind of off the wall. But if enough people get behind an idea and accept it and kind of uh, internalize it, it becomes on the wall, something which can be understood and realized by people. And this is in many respects what happened with the healthcare case. You had an argument that at the outset very few people took seriously, but due to the efforts of a number of leading academics and scholars, um, not to mention leading Republicans in the government, Tea Party people, who kind of rallied around a constitutional idea that the government cannot force you to buy health insurance. The government cannot force you to buy broccoli. Broccoli, the enduring image of this entire challenge. Who here actually likes broccoli? Does anyone actually like broccoli? A bunch of doctors. Okay, everyone raises their hand. I don't. I don't like it. But for whatever reason, this became the enduring image of the challenge. Can Congress force you to buy broccoli? So this talk will focus on how this challenge went from really something small to something that almost went to the Supreme Court and invalidated a signature piece of legislation the President of the United States and could have almost drastically changed the way we look at constitutional law. This is the story of what went, outside, what went on both inside the court and outside the court. Some of our other speakers will focus a lot on the justices and what did they do and how did they reason. My focus is more precise. I'm looking at the people outside the court and how they affected the way the judges inside the court look at the Constitution. And this is really the, the process of popular constitutionalism. Let's start with a little bit of background on the individual mandate. The mandate was not invented in 2009. In fact, it has a longer history. It dates back to the early 1990s. You might remember something called Hillary Care, which was President Clinton's attempt to make some sort of uh, uh, universal coverage. As an alternative to universal coverage, like a single-payer system like they have in Canada, a number of conservatives advanced something called a mandate. It was a free market alternative. It said, if you don't want to buy health insurance, pay a tax. So rather than forcing people into a, you know, some kind of single-payer system, they gave people the choice. This was a conservative free market idea. Fast forward to the uh, late 90s and early 2000s. Governor of Massachusetts, Mitt Romney, he's currently running for president. He imposed an individual mandate in his state. He required that all citizens of Massachusetts purchase health insurance. In fairness to the governor, there's a difference between the states and the feds doing this, but we'll put that aside for now. Fast forward to the 2008 election. You had candidate Clinton versus candidate Obama. One of them wanted an individual mandate, one of them didn't. Hillary Clinton wanted it, Obama opposed the mandate. It's actually fascinating to go back and watch the debates from 2008 where Barack Obama, uh, Barack Obama said, I will not have an individual mandate. That's not the way to do it. I guess it didn't really matter because on election, everything changed. After the election, Obama said, now we're going to have a mandate. That was his new plan. This law was in debating for almost an entire year before it was enacted. Although almost all the debates focused on policy issues. Should we have a government option? How do we structure healthcare markets? Do we have these things called exchanges? There are all these other ancillary issues. But one issue was really kind of pushed the back, which is, is this law constitutional? Other than a few scholars and a few law professors along the way, 
there was not a very strong sense that this law is unconstitutional. Um, in fact, most famously, uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi when asked, is this constitutional? She said, are you serious? Are you kidding? Um, the members of Congress didn't really consider this as a valid challenge. It wasn't until the, the almost eve of when this law was passed that a number of senators made a constitutional point of order saying, hey, this is, unco excuse me, this is unconstitutional. So what happened? And why did it happen? The Affordable Care Act was passed on December 24, 2009. I have a little timeline here to just give you a sense of the scale. This might give you, this might help you explain how things progress, how quickly they progress. By the time the law was passed, December 24, 2009, there have already been some murmurings along among some constitutional law professors saying that this is unconstitutional. Why? It was unprecedented. Unprecedented, what does that mean? Well, in law, precedent is a term that means Congress has done something like this before, and the Supreme Court has said it's okay. So if Congress has, you know, done something before and the Supreme Court said that's fine, they can do something like this again. The argument was there was no precedent for something like this. Never before had Congress required people to purchase something. Now, people who had chosen to purchase something could be taxed. They can be regulated. If you want to run a business, the government can put regulations on that. If you want to buy a car, the government can put regulations on that. But if you choose not to do something, if you choose not to purchase health insurance, now the government can put regulations on that. They can actually fine you or tax you. It's debatable how you actually phrase it. But they can actually make you pay money if you choose not to buy health insurance. And the argument was that this was unprecedented, that none of the Supreme Court's precedents covered this. There have been earlier cases. You had a farmer, uh, actually Fred Filburn, he was actually in Ohio somewhere, and he had wheat. And there was a law saying that you can't grow more than a certain amount of wheat. And he says, hey, wait a minute. The only people eating this wheat are me and my family and my farm animals. I'm not selling this in any market. Congress says it doesn't matter. Even if the wheat never leaves your farm, we can tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. Another recent case involving medicinal marijuana. Angel Raish in California, she had a very advanced cancer, and the only form of relief was medicinal marijuana. She grew it on her farm, where she lives in California. She never sold it, never left her farm. She never had any intent to sell it. Congress says it doesn't matter. You are growing marijuana. We can regulate it and say you can't have it. This, the challengers argued, was different. A choice not to buy health insurance is inactivity. This is actually Nate's paper later. Congress has never regulated inactivity. Now, granted, people might ultimately need health insurance. Everyone probably will at some point. But that doesn't matter. In the present, you have made no choice about health insurance. And, and some might think this argument is you know, trivial, but the truth is the government never had a very good response to it. The government's response simply was health care is different. Everyone might need health insurance, which, which is a response, but it doesn't resolve the fact that Congress had never before regulated inactivity. So this is kind of the backdrop when the law was enacted in December of 2009. Between December 2009 and March 20, uh, 2010, there were a number of uh, debates in the Senate to try and get this law passed. The reason why it was hard to get this law passed was Senator Ted Kennedy died. And when Ted Kennedy passed away, he was replaced by Scott Brown, a Republican. And the Democrats lost their 60th vote in the Senate. And they could no longer break a filibuster. So the bill that went to the House was not even the final intended bill. They actually just sent to the House a bill that was an earlier draft. And there were a lot of fatal defects in the draft, one of which is whether the law was, whether the penalty is called a tax or, or a fee. It was actually kind of a fatal flaw that came back to haunt them years later. But in any event, on March 22nd, 2010, with a Tea Party protest outside the Capitol going, kill the bill, the bill was passed. The very next day, there was a signing in the White House where President uh, Obama signed the law. This was not the end. Usually when a law is enacted, people are celebrating, they're happy, and they're ready to go, but not with lawyers. Lawyers the buzz kills. Minutes after the ink dried on this paper, minutes, complaints were filed in federal courts across the United States. I spoke with one of the lawyers from Florida. He said he filed it 12 minutes after the president signed the paper. <laughs> And they were actually in a race 
with Virginia, another state with this dude. Virginia had about 25 minutes. I think they had some filing problems. The reason why was because the states challenging this law knew that this was going to the Supreme Court. They wanted to be first. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. So, so the president used about 23 pens. You can kind of see in this picture. Because they give him away as like souvenirs, so he kind of drew like part of his name, part of his name, part of his name. So before the ink was even dry on the 23rd pen, the lawsuits were filed. I mean, this was something very quick. So the first one was in the Northern District of Florida. A complaint was filed with about 20 various states. And the states made a few arguments. One focused on the Medicaid expansion, which I won't talk about too much. But they said that the health care law places uh, a lot of burdens on the state through Medicare, and it's unconstitutional. Okay, I'm sorry, Medicaid. The other issue was Congress can't force citizens, you know, the citizens of Florida, for example, to purchase health insurance. Shortly thereafter, you had another complaint filed in Virginia, I think about eight minutes later. And then after that, there were, there were complaints filed all over the country. When these, when these complaints were first filed, you know, there was a small cohort of you know, academics and lawyers who kind of thought this would be uh, possible. But by and large, most people can see this challenge would not, not go too far. That really changed on October 14th, 2010, a few months later. Um, not to go too much into to, to legal mumbo jumbo, but there's something called a motion to dismiss. This is a way for a judge to toss out a case at a very early juncture if it's, if it's crap. I mean, if, there, if, there, if there's really no merit to a case, the judge will toss it out. Doesn't need to go to a jury, doesn't need to go to fact finding, just get rid of it. A lot of people thought this should be tossed out in a motion to dismiss. This is clearly constitutional. But then you had a federal judge in Virginia in October of 2010 saying, no, this has some merit to it. About two months later, whoops, went too far. About a few months later, you had another judge who also denied a motion to dismiss. So now you have two federal judges saying this case has merit. And while this is going on, keep in mind what's going on in 2010. The midterm elections are coming up very soon. And if you remember the 2010 midterm elections, the Republicans uh, swept, and they, they did actually very well, largely buoyed by the Tea Party. And one of the rallying cries of the Tea Party was repeal this law, repeal Obamacare, kill it. These factors are not coincidences. In order to take this challenge from off the wall to on the wall, there was a very concerted effort to appeal to the populace and say, listen, this is something that the government can't do. This is not how we view the Constitution. It was a very um, uh, ingenious strategy to try to change public opinion. In another article I'm working on, I've actually tracked every opinion poll about the healthcare law from 2009 to 2012. They did them every month. And just trying to chart month by month how it fluctuated in relationship to the political events of the backdrop. It's absolutely fascinating to look at it from this kind of a sociological perspective. <laughs> then, a few months later, in December of 2010, the judge of Virginia grants summary judgment. What does that mean? As a matter of law, the government loses. Doesn't even need to go to a trial. That the case is so clear that the judge can actually enter in a judgment for the, for the uh, challengers. At this point, the health care law is unconstitutional. You actually had a judge declaring that this law, which regulates a huge sector of the economy, is outside of Congress's powers to regulate commerce. When this happened, people were getting apoplectic. And note also, this is December 2010, about, about a month after the midterm elections. Then the, then the other shoe dropped in Florida. And this was the biggie. This was Judge Vinson. This was a lawsuit with 20-odd states. And the judge ruled, as a matter of law, this law is unconstitutional. What made this opinion most noteworthy, though, is how the judge got there. He made a number of references and opinions to Tea Party rhetoric. He referenced, can the government make you buy broccoli? He referenced the Boston Tea Party. He referenced, uh, you know, colonial imagery and, 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 and tyranny from the government. There were a lot of very salient imagery in this opinion that, 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 that channels this kind of popular constitutionalist norm of how people relate to the Constitution. Um, and this was really what set things in motion. Because once you have court striking this law down, that gives teeth to the challenge. Because now you know the challenge is legs. In our system of government, we have a couple tiers of courts. We have the trial court called the Federal District Court. We have a Court of Appeals followed by the U.S. Supreme Court. There were a number of Court of Appeals opinions that consider this. 
the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, I used to clerk there, but I was not involved in this case, uh, upheld the law. The Eleventh Circuit, which is based in Atlanta and heard the appeal from the Florida case, said this law is unconstitutional. So yet now we have what's called a split of circuits. When you have one court of appeals that says one thing, and another court of appeals says something else, you have a split. There's a different of authorities. And the Supreme Court will generally take a case when you have different courts of appeals who disagree. Once the Eleventh Circuit said that this law is unconstitutional, you knew this was going to the Supreme Court because there was a split of authorities. And then there were a couple other uh, court of appeals that also said the law was constitutional. So in a manner of from March 2010 when the law was enacted to about the summer of 2011, you know, barely a year and a half at last, the entire way that people kind of viewed constitutional law evolved. This really came out of almost, well, I was going to say left field, probably more like right field. It was, it, was, it was quite unprecedented. And what made this challenge solidified was what happened in November of 2011. The Supreme Court accepted review of this case. But they didn't just accept review. They assigned it almost six hours of oral argument time. Usually the Supreme Court gives each case one hour of argument time. This case got three days with six hours spread over three days. That was largely unprecedented. There hadn't been that many uh, hours for a case in years. This is the Supreme Court's way of saying, hey, this is an important issue, so we're going to take our time with it. A lot of people thought that the Supreme Court might just summarily reverse the lower court and say, hey, this law is constitutional. We don't want to get involved. But the Supreme Court went through it full tilt. March 26, 2012, exactly almost two years to the date after the original law was enacted, the Supreme Court heard our argument. The people aspect of it is just wonderful. Um, there are only 50 seats to the public available at the Supreme Court on any given day. And those tickets are given on a first-come, first-served basis. So the way to do it is you actually have to wait outside the Supreme Court. The tickets are handed out at 6 a.m. It's almost like a concert. I've slept outside the Supreme Court twice. It's not comfortable because the Supreme Court is coming at 3 a.m. It gets very wet. And in, in Washington, in the middle of March, I actually was there a couple years ago in March. It's really cold. It's very cold. You're just camping out. And when the sprinkles come on, it wakes you up. It's really bad. <laughs> so people lined up 72 hours in advance to get tickets to the Supreme Court to see this case. You know there are no cameras in the court. So the only way to witness it is to be there. And people were waiting there for three days outside. The first person online I actually spoke to, she was a single mother from Atlanta. Uh, her child had some sort of health condition. And uh, had this law been struck down, her child would have lost coverage. Um, a couple of other people were law students and various other people involved. You have to keep in mind that this is a law that affects people. It's not just about commerce and, and the Supreme Court. And these saw the laws, the protests, the people outside. It's fascinating to kind of view all the, the human dynamics of this case because there's just so much, to use the phrase of this term, humanities. There's a lot in this case. So argument was held over three days. I won't bore you with the details of the technical issues, but the main event came on day number two of whether the mandate was constitutional. Could Congress force people to purchase health insurance? And I'll tell you what, after reading the transcripts, I, I listened to the arguments as well. It wasn't looking very good for the government. It wasn't at all. Chief Justice Roberts, we all know, eventually provided the open vote to save the law, was extremely hostile and aggressive to the government's lawyer. Ultimately, Roberts had a very curious way of resolving the case where he accepted this argument that the law is a tax, even though it's not called a tax. During argument, Robert was beating the government lawyer over the head, saying, this is not a tax. How can you call it a tax? It's not labeled. But ultimately, he accepted that very argument. This kind of changed position actually gives credence to some of the rumors you might have read that Robert switched his vote. I won't indulge in any rumors because I have no inside information. But, but there is circumstantial enough evidence to think that, that that might be plausible. But at the time, it was seen that the swing vote was really not Roberts, it was Justice Kennedy. And Justice Kennedy was very, very, very direct. He asked the government, can you help me? He said, this law is unprecedented. Has Congress ever required people who engage in no activity to do something? And the government lawyer had no good answer. And that seemed to resolve the issue. 
I mentioned this earlier, but I'm actually writing a book about this case by the title of Unprecedented. I actually wrote an ending to this book before the case was decided. I was so confident in how the case was decided, I actually wrote how I thought the case would come out. That would save my drafting over the summer. Needless to say, to rewrite the book. But I actually, I actually wrote several op-eds with various outcomes of the case ready to re-release in the day of the case, in other words. <laughs> so that, that was kind of a waste of my time. But this case was seen as going down. I did a number of interviews with people on both left and right in the month of June before the case was decided. And the people on the left were like, oh my god, this is so bad. People on the right were like, yeah, yeah, we're going to win. And then, and then I talked to the same people a couple weeks later, and it was the exact other way. People were like, oh, yeah. And the liberals were like, I knew all along we'd win. I'm like, no, you didn't. <laughs> and then the conservatives were like, well, you know, I, I thought we had a, you know, it was a fit. No, no, you thought you were going to win. So there was, there was this huge, you know, shift in how people viewed this case, which is just, just fascinating. So anyway, what happened? So between March and June, the decision date came down June 20th, 2012. What happened? So Jan Crawford, who's a reporter for CBS, published this explosive report saying that Chief Justice Roberts switched his vote. Why? Roberts was afraid that the Supreme Court's legitimacy as an institution would be harmed if the court struck down this law. What does that mean? The courts are unelected. They're not really accountable to anyone but the democratic process. The court's ability to strike down laws and to be a respect institution is very closely related to how people perceive the court. If people stop respecting the court or view it just as a political institution, its legitimacy is harmed. People won't view it as a body that's operating in fairness and justice. It will simply be a body operating as politicians in robes. The theory goes that Roberts was very much afraid of what would happen if the court struck down this law. There will be a backlash. Perhaps the president would run against the court. Perhaps the president would, would uh, criticize the court. He's done that before. Remember at the State of the Union a couple years ago, uh, President Obama, with the justice sitting right there, criticized him for the Citizens United decision. Justice Alito famously shook his head and said, not true. So we know this is a president who's not afraid to criticize and go after the court. In fact, a couple of days after the Supreme Court argument, President Obama was in the news saying that it would be unprecedented, unprecedented, he used that word, for the court to strike this law down. So the president had a direct, I don't want to call it a threat, but it was a, it was a, it was a blow to the court thing. Don't do this. So the thinking was Roberts may have been afraid. So let's take a step back and think about this. When I opened up, I, I argue that the challengers of this law grounded it in notions of popular constitutionalism. The notion was that, hey, this law is very unpopular. People don't like it. You know. This will create a political climate where it will be okay for the court to strike down this law. This was the, the message. That because this law is something very unpopular, if the court chooses to strike it down, the climate will be okay for that to happen. But that door swings both ways. When you ask judges to kind of consider how people view the law in making their decision and what would happen, it can go either way. The same forces that may have led Roberts to want to strike down this law, saying that this is something unpopular, I have political cover to do this, may have pushed him the other direction. It may have pushed him to saying, if I do this, there'll be a significant backlash against the court, and I'll end up worse off than I was before. So there might be some perverse incentives for using this kind of popular constitutionalist attack on a law of this magnitude. And what's fascinating is this kind of idea of popular constitutionalism has historically been associated with liberals. The Warren Court was very much a court in tune with what the people wanted and trying to advance side in progressive nature. The modern legal conservative movement evolved as an opposite to that. It was grounded in restraint, textualism, originalism, strict constructionism. These are words you might have heard. It was this notion that courts should not be stepping outside the bounds of what the democracy enacts. But this case kind of reversed it. All of a sudden, many liberals and progressives were saying, no court should be restrained. They should not be looking to these other factors of society, just, just stick to the precedents. And then conservatives, who for many years said stick to the precedents, said no, we should kind of broaden this and then kind of influence how the Supreme Court understands the Constitution by notions of popular culture. And it, it's very possible and, and perhaps likely that, that these kind of forces impacted the outcome of the case. Now, of course, we don't know for sure what happened. We don't know why the court did what it did. We do know, though, 
is that it almost worked. And I think there are a lot of lessons that can be learned from this going forward. For one, what does this mean for originalism? Originalism is a doctrine that says we should decide constitutional law cases based on what the Constitution meant at the time it was enacted. You know, how would commerce have been understood in 1787? Okay? That wasn't this challenge. The people who brought this challenge didn't make it about originalism. They made it about consistent with existing precedents. How do we fit this into the New Deal regime of constitutional law? Another issue is what does this mean for, for liberals? Um, liberals were very much inclined to be very restrained and opposed to kind of a, uh, to use, excuse the majority of an activist court. What happens in a couple of years when liberals are in the minority in the court and they want to advance some sort of a, a new, new right? Well, the same notions of restraint remain. Or does everything go out the window? Is this case so unique? Is it just sui generis? Is it a case by itself that all norms were out the window and both sides at all costs willing to win? I don't know. I really don't know. And I think there are a lot of lingering questions about this case and, and why I think it's so important we have a conference like this to study from all the various angles. One issue for you, people do medical ethics focus on, is how, if at all, these notions of popular constitutionalism should be affected by access to healthcare. I think in large part you had a you had a, a crash course in this case. You know, common law experts had to become experts on medical law right away, <laughs> and healthcare experts have become experts on common law right away. And I think there's probably a large divergence of, of knowledge and information among those various experts. And I think it's with that, I think I'll wrap up and open up for questions. And particularly from this audience, I'm interested in learning how you felt about the case. Yes, sir. Could you comment, please, on the government's approach to whether or not this was a tax? You know, when they were making their argument. Well, the government was in a very strict position. The president made it clear that he wasn't going to raise taxes. He went on George Stephanopoulos' show in 2009-ish, and he said, I will not raise taxes. Stephanopoulos asked him, is the health care law a tax? Obama said no. When they were enacting this law, in earlier versions of the law, it was actually called a tax. As the law progressed through the drafting history, that changed. Although it was kept in the section of the code impacting the Eternal Revenue Service, which would suggest it's a tax, it wasn't called a tax. It was called a penalty. So you have this kind of almost bizarre situation where Congress wanted to enact a tax, but they didn't want to take the political hit for it. If the Congress had enacted a tax, then they would have been stuck with being, raising taxes, and they did not want to do that. So the government was in this bizarre position that it wasn't called a tax, but it acted like a tax, so we should treat it as a tax. And that's how Roberts saved it. He called it a saving construction. He's like, well, it's not really a tax, but as a judge, I had the duty to find the, the, the most um, you know, easiest way to pull this law, and I will read it as a tax. I mean, Roberts effectively had to rewrite the statute to get to his outcome. It wasn't a tax, but he read it as a tax. Um, Yes. So I'm going to have to stop right there. That put this at 30 minutes. I don't want to take time away from Brian. If anybody has questions for Josh, uh, we'll have a lunch right after this session. So uh, feel free to chat about that. Or, or if you have further questions, we can do that at the end of the meeting. Okay. Thank Thanks. you very much. Who enabled me to be here, invited me. Same list of names as Josh stated. Uh, enjoy conferences like this, so it's a mix. And uh, appreciate Josh's presentation right now. He mentioned a lot of things that I'm going to mention. So uh, I think I probably have time. So we'll maybe we'll be able to QA. I don't know if I'll take all the time, but I'll do my best. Uh, my, part, my paper. Uh, also discusses the act, and it uh, sort of takes a different tack. Uh, it focuses upon the act, how the act fits into society in two different ways, and I compare the act to the uh, Brown versus Board of Education decision of 1954, and also on a bigger scale compared to the social contract in the United States that the unwritten bargain in society between people and the state to provide for 
the citizens, provide things like health care, provide things like unemployment, retirement, those basic things that we all take for granted a lot, but in the 20th century became really big. And it started to become big under FDR, as many of you all know, with the, uh, with the New Deal. And just to give you an idea of how slow things move in the, in the U.S. on the social contract, it was back in the 30s that the United States wanted to provide health care for everyone. They wanted to on the FDR. That was one of their big deals. And they especially so wanted to provide comprehensive health coverage for the elderly with a prescription drug benefit in the 1930s. They eventually did get that. 